At the start of the 1800s, Newfoundland and Labrador had little in the way of medical services. Doctors were rare, and most of them worked in St. John's or the larger settlements at Conception Bay. Those who did service the smaller outports had to cover a large geographic area. Their visits were infrequent and inconsistent. In many places, healers had to come from the home and the community. They had no formal training. It was usually up to the mother to treat any illnesses in the family. She relied on home remedies made from the resources at hand. Partridge berry jam for sore throats, cherry bark tea for diarrhea, rhubarb for constipation, and goose grease for chest colds. Children received a daily dose of cod oil for general good health. All of this knowledge was passed down from one generation to the next. There were also superstitions. Some people believed that the seventh son had special healing powers, or that warts would disappear if the sufferer threw a coin under a porch. Midwives were an important part of 19th century health care. In Newfoundland and Labrador, they were often called granny women. They were well-respected, elderly members of the community. Granny women delivered babies, but they could also be called upon to cure colds and a wide range of other ailments. Some outport families paid them with vegetables or cash, but many people were too poor to give them anything at all. An aging midwife often selected and trained another local woman to become her replacement. Her successor was usually chosen with the consent of the entire community. As the colony's population increased, more and more doctors arrived from the British Isles. Most settled in St. John's. Among them was a Scottish doctor named William Carson. In 1830, he wrote about the general health problems facing the island. Annually, eight or ten passage vessels arrive from Ireland at the port of St. John's, bringing from 11 to 1300 passengers who generally carry with them the epidemics of those places from whence they embarked. Few years therefore pass without an importation of typhus fever, smallpox, measles, whooping cough or scarlet fever, and annually an abundant supply of itch. But they all soon assume a milder character and seldom exist more than a season. Gout and rheumatism maintain nearly the same proportion to the population which they do in England. Stone in the urinary organs rarely occur, but biliary concretions are very prevalent and are often predictive of serious derangement of the digestive organs. When Carson first arrived at St. John's, he was shocked by the scarcity of medical facilities. The only hospitals in the growing city belonged to the British military. Civilian patients were only admitted if there was room. Carson spearheaded a large campaign to build a hospital for the general public. As a result, the Riverhead Hospital opened in what is now Victoria Park in downtown St. John's on May 7, 1814. It provided a vital service, but it was badly underfunded. The building quickly fell into disrepair. More change came in 1870 when the British Army finally relinquished its large hospital on Forest Road to the Newfoundland government. The building reopened one year later as a publicly funded civilian hospital. The dilapidated Riverhead transferred most of its patients to the new state-of-the-art General Hospital. Another step forward came in 1899, when the General Hospital made Margaret Rendell its superintendent of nursing. She was the first professionally trained nurse to work in Newfoundland. Then, in 1903, the General Hospital established its own school for nurses under the direction of Mary Southcott. Better medical services also developed outside of St. John's. By the mid-1800s, resident physicians were living in many of Newfoundland's larger outports. Most were English, Scottish, or Irish doctors who had moved to the island. It became common for the children of outport doctors to study medicine in the United Kingdom or United States and then return to the colony to set up practice in or near their home communities. Outport doctors had to be versatile. Far from any hospitals and pharmacies, they were expected to diagnose patients, perform surgeries, and dispense medicines. They could be called upon to treat everything from toothaches to tumors and broken bones and fevers. 
They usually worked in a wide geographic area and had to travel long distances by boat or horseback in the summer and by snowshoe or dog sled during the winter. In the early decades of the 19th century, a doctor's medical bag would have included a variety of surgical tools. Among these would have been an amputation saw. Enema syringes would have been present, and also a bleeding set. Bloodletting and sweat-inducing procedures were common treatments for a variety of ailments. Doctors would have carried supplies for making medicines too, tiny scales and a mortar and pestle. By the end of the century, more sophisticated tools would have been present. Stethoscopes were becoming more widespread. So were thermometers and tongue depressors and percussion hammers for testing reflexes. It was always a challenge for outport doctors to obtain the medicines they needed when they needed them. Pharmacies had opened at St. John's by the late 1800s, but rural doctors did not have this convenience. They still had to wait weeks for an order to arrive. In Twillingate, Dr. William Sterling received this letter after requesting drugs for a patient. November 25th, 1889, my dear sir, I have well considered your note of the 21st and find there would not be time to get the medicine you advise if ordered by letter. But if I sent the enclosed cablegram early today, I should receive it about the 9th of December. The importation of diseases from other countries was another major concern for Newfoundland and Labrador. A cholera epidemic killed more than 500 people in 1854. Four years later, diphtheria claimed more than 1,000 lives. There were also large outbreaks of typhus fever in 1847 and smallpox in 1843. Many of these diseases arrived at Newfoundland and Labrador aboard vessels that had traveled here from Europe or other places in North America. To combat these epidemics, the government established quarantine ports across the colony and set up boards of health in the different communities. Measures like these protected the island from a cholera epidemic that ripped through much of Europe and North America in the 1830s. When an Irish vessel approached St. John's in 1832 with cholera victims on board, the government took aggressive steps to prevent it from entering port. Sir, the President requests that you will give orders that a shot shall be fired from one of the batteries in the direction of the bark now lying in the Narrows, with passengers bound to Quebec, in the event of the masters attempting to bring that vessel within the harbour. In Labrador, hospitals and health boards developed much more slowly than they did on the island. Traditional Aboriginal medicines played a vital role. Midwives were also important, and Moravian missionaries provided medical services too. By the mid-1800s, the Moravians had built stations along much of Labrador's northern coast, at places like Okak, Hebron, Makovic, and Nain. Major positive change came to Labrador near the end of the century. In 1892, the British doctor Wilfred Grenfell visited Labrador. He was appalled by the lack of medical resources available to the local people. He spearheaded a fundraising campaign later that year, which resulted in the establishment of a hospital at Battle Harbor in 1893 and another one at Indian Harbor in 1894. In 1905, a Harvard professor named Edward Moore visited the hospital at Battle Harbor. He wrote about the patients he saw there. The first was a woman who had traveled 200 miles to have a large tumor removed. She would have died if the hospital hadn't been there. The other case was that of a man with a fearfully swelled and discolored arm, septic to his shoulder, probably from a wound in the hand when splitting fish. The water around the stages becomes so incredibly foul, and the men's blood is often so impoverished. This man came from Red Bay, on the Labrador side of the Straits. In a day or two he would have lost his arm, and before long his life. Six men brought him over in a rowboat, sixty-five miles, and then quietly rowed back. They would be gone from their fishing three days at a time of year when if they do not fish, they will be poor to the point of starvation for a whole year. The season is so very short, and this is just the height of it, and yet 
They did not seem to think they were doing anything great. Because of Grenfell's determination, more hospitals and nursing stations opened at some of Newfoundland and Labrador's most remote locations, places like St. Anthony on the northern peninsula and Forteau in southern Labrador. All throughout the 1800s, pioneer medical practitioners like Wilfred Grenfell, William Carson, and Mary Southcott laid the foundation for the continued development of Newfoundland and Labrador's healthcare system in the 20th century. Hey. 